why do you get to be here for that? A um, couple things that we need to uh, do. I want to make a, just a couple reminders. Tuesday night, we have an open leadership meeting. It's going to be joint leadership of Master's Way, and that can be any of you that want to come to that meeting. It's going to be open. Um, and Crosswinds, and it's going to be here. So 6.30 Tuesday night, want to invite you into that. Also, I want to just remind you, especially as you're connected to people that I don't even know, um, if there are people that have questions and they're trying to process what's going on in the changes and stuff, my, I've made my email available to whoever. It's just my name, Ron Martoya at Gmail. So I just want to remind you, if you've got people that say, hey, you know what, you need to probably talk to Ron about that or talk to Carl about that. Um, please let people know that, you know, if they've got questions or they want to ask uh, stuff that they can, they can get into my email queue on that, okay?
so today we get to launch into a new series, and I'm kind of excited about it. Um, and I want to I want to tell you why we're doing this. The church in general is by and large slow to respond to change. Not Master's Way. The church. (laughs) The big C church. It's true in Europe. It's true in South America. It's true in India. It's true in Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And it's definitely true in the United States. We're slow to respond to change. And so for a lot of people, their experience of church, if they're outside of the church, they don't have any church memory, they didn't grow up in the church, they didn't grow up going to Sunday school, hearing stories, they didn't have that experience. They walk into the church and they are used to being in a culture, they're used to being in an environment that is pretty on point, pretty up to date, pretty high tech, and in an area like Huntsville in particular, high tech is sort of life. That's how it is. And then people who don't know God, they walk into a church, and for most people, they will tell us, the research says, they feel like they're walking into a 150-year time warp. (laughs) They feel like they're walking into a time warp. And not, not just because of the buildings, but because of how we communicate, because we've got a Christian subculture language that you've got to learn to speak if you want to communicate with us. We use words that people don't understand. We don't do a very good job of translating those. We walk into many churches and, you know, the sage is up on stage in an academic robe. That's where we get vestments. They're actually academic robes first and then became vestments. And people go, gosh, man, I'm not living in that world anymore. And so what I want to do is I want to try to help us start thinking about what would it be like if we actually did church Google style? Because that's the world we live in. I think most of the church continues to be stuck in a culture of text when most of culture has moved on to hypertext. You get the illustration here? Yep. And so I want to frame, and the reason why this becomes important is because I want to frame today, in the next eight weeks or so, around these three questions. What are you searching for? What, or who are you searching for? And what is it that they are searching for? This will make more sense as we unfold this, but what are you searching for? Who are you searching for? And what are they searching for? All right? So that, that's kind of where we're going to go. So with that in mind, let, let, me, let me ask you a question here. In 1436, we had an epic event that was going to change the world. Do you know what that event is? What happened in 1946? Or 14, I'm sorry, 1436? What's that? Gutenberg. Gutenberg. Historian, apparently. But I've telegraphed it enough. 1436, what comes online is a printing press. And for the first time, we have the opportunity for individual people to have books, to study on their own, to learn, to grow, to move forward. I mean, for the first time. And in the church, I mean, the first book that came off the Gutenberg Press was the Gutenberg Bible. First book off the press. And for the first time, you didn't have to go to a community where somebody told you stories, mostly gospel stories, but not very much of Paul was even discussed up till Gutenberg. Not a lot. Because it's sort of academic. It's a lot of rational argumentation. Harder to just hear stories about. But the gospel stories were told. And most of it was told either through stained glass or murals. And a communicator just talking about the stories became very, very important. But with Gutenberg, all of a sudden, you've got your own text. You can study, and authority dramatically shifted. It wasn't just now about the priest. You could check out what the priest was saying. You could actually read it and go, ah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Hmm. It used to be just in Latin, so nobody could really decipher it. Not anymore. 
And so authority shifted significantly. Now it wasn't just about the priests. It was about you. It was about me. We, we could go ahead and investigate. And we could go ahead and start into actually forming some of our own ideas because we could check it out. Now, that's really good, but it's also really bad because it created something of an individualism. This individualism said, you know what, I could go ahead and Eric could say, you know what, I'm reading this. You know, I don't know if I agree. And I could say, yeah, you know, I'm reading it too. I'm not sure I agree either. And all of a sudden, what was one big happy family, because what the priest said went, was like, ah, oh, maybe not. A lot of changed when Bert Gutenberg came online. So at the turn of the 19th century into the 20th century, this guy shows up and he says, you know what? I want to make Gutenberg highly available. You know who this guy is? Andrew Carnegie, over the course of 40 years, decided that he wanted to make books available and over 40 years built 1,700 libraries. Now, this is going somewhere. Just hang with me here. He wanted to make learning available for the masses. And so he went ahead and built 1,700 libraries over the course of 40 years. That made Gutenberg ubiquitous. It made books possible. It made, it made the access of the technology of the day available to lots and lots of communities that wouldn't have it otherwise. In fact, I grew up going to an Andrew Carnegie branch library in Summit Township of Jackson, Michigan. I remember. You know, going in and sitting in the little, you know, little kids' stools, and you could go get little books out of the thing. And they had great big slabs that you put in book markers. You know, book markers pull out the book. It's like some of you've never even been in a library. And it's like, yeah, what? Huh? Look at some of the younger ones going, libraries? Look, both paper? Paper books? You've got to be kidding, right? That's the world we live in, though. We've got a generation going, paper books? You guys read paper books, eh? Right? This past Wednesday, April 4th, we celebrated a major event that happened 40 years ago. You know who this guy is? Martin Cooper? 40 years ago, this past Wednesday, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of what is a bigger event than Gutenberg. 1973, April 4th, Martin Cooper made the first cell phone call. Thank you for that on cue, that cell phone beat. <laughs> now I want you to think about this. It took Andrew Carnegie 40 years to build 1,700 libraries to make Gutenberg available to the masses. In 40 years, we have had a technology that is spread a little quicker than 1,700 branches. Are you tracking with where this is going? We have on the planet 17 or 7 billion people. Let me ask you a question. How many cell phone subscribers do you think we have of the 7 billion on the planet? Let's just take some guesses. 1 billion? What do you think? A tr well, there's only 7 billion, so that would mean all of us have a whole hundreds of phones. And that's, but that's a good guess. I'll go with it. What else? Come on, 1 billion I hear. What else? What's that? 5 billion. Anybody else? 4. 3. 3. Do you know what? Well, trillion was over, but everybody else is too low. Out of... 7 billion people on the planet, there are 6 billion different cell phone subscribers in our world. Look at these pictures. I have been in India numerous times, in hovel shack cities where they have cell phones. Many of you know I, I lived a good chunk, three quarters of 2011 in Cape Town, South Africa, but was in Kayaliche and Kayamunde, these shack townships of five million people with cell phones. Living in a cardboard shack with a dirt floor with cell phones. 
Now, why is that important? So what, Ron? What's that have to do with what we're talking about? We're in church. Well, it has a lot to do with it. Because we're living in a generation and a time, and this is what's so interesting, is that of those 6 billion cell phone subscribers, 85% of those are connected to the internet. And you know what? Stanford just hit putting their one millionth book online. The Library of Congress is in contract with Google to put up four to five million of their volumes online. That means 85% of those six billion cell phone subscribers can tap the million holdings of Stanford, the four million holdings of the Library of Congress that Google will put up. That means that the opportunities to connect, to have knowledge, to hear sermons, to do study, is all of a sudden within the reach of hundreds of millions and billions of people that just a few years ago would have never even had that as an opportunity. We live in a totally different world. A totally different world. And you know what? The church continues to largely do ministry in a Gutenberg style. Agreed? The church is largely stuck doing Gutenberg ministry in a Google world, doing textual stuff in a hypertext world, and we're trying to figure out why is it that nobody really wants to come to our party anymore? What's the story with that, right? What is that about? And of course, there's going to be people who say, well, yeah, 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 but you know, what about tradition? And, but you know what? Let me tell you something, man. Tradition is really overrated. Tradition is nice. It's nice to reflect upon what's been. It's nice to say, hey, there's things that from what's been that we want to bring into the future. But I want to remind you of something. Moses was the one that said over and over again, hey, to Israel, remember, 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 remember. Remember the Red Sea. Remember what God did for you, taking you out of Egypt. Remember, remember, remember. But you know what? I want to remind you of one thing. Isaiah came on the scene and Isaiah said, you know what, Israel? You're stuck in remembering. You are stuck. And what I want to do is I want to encourage you to stop remembering and quit going over old history. That's what he says, Isaiah 43, verse 18. Quit going over old history. I want to do a new thing. Don't you see it? It's breaking out all around you. He literally came on the scene and was a heretic and said, listen, cut out the remembering. The remembering's holding you back. You're still camping at the Red Sea hoping God's going to do Red Seas again. And God's done doing Red Seas. He's doing new things. And you're camping at the Red Sea. And you know what? It's where the church sits. A lot of the church. Not all the church, but a lot of the church. A lot of the church is waiting for God to do the reruns. And God's not doing syndicated reruns. He's doing new things. So the challenge for us is to figure out how do we move from a textual to a hypertext culture. Last month, Samsung released the Galaxy S4, and this is their advertisement. They're calling their cell phone a life companion. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You, guys, you don't need to be the gal. Just get an S4. You got a life companion. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but this is our culture, right? This is how our culture is thinking. This is where people are sitting, right? I mean, many of us, I mean, we haven't, none of us have had a cell phone for more than 40 years. I mean, remember those first cell phones? I mean, like, you'd throw your back out trying to answer the thing. Okay, hello? I mean, you need to go to the chiropractor after that. It's a big box, you know, suitcase almost. Cost a thousand bucks. First ones did. Thousand bucks. Now, you get a two year contract, other than a couple phones on the market, you can get almost any phone free. Right? Now, why all this? We have said to people over and over, we really want to reach you for Jesus. But first, we need to de Google you and get you back into the Gutenberg world, because that's the world we operate in. I think that's what we've said. Hey, listen, we're living in the Gutenberg world because we really like tradition. We like the way it feels, smells, tastes, and, and looks. And so if you could just sort of like de-Google and get back to Gutenberg, you could really be all about this. And the average person's going, no, no, I don't think so. 
Because I, I really don't want to operate in a 150-year time warp, not in my spiritual life, not in any part of my life. And so the reason I do, I, I wanted to give you that little prelude into this this morning is because I want us to ask this question, what are you searching for? Who are you searching for? And what are they searching for? Because I think in a Google world, it's really all about the search. I don't think the hottest topics into the future are going to be musical style, worship style. I don't think it's going to be how you decorate an auditorium. I don't think that's going to be the main thing. I think it's going to be us figuring out how do Google culture people think spiritually? Not Christianly, spiritually first. How do they think? Now, the fact of the matter is most of us in this room live in a Google culture, but we step back in time a bit when we come into our churches to go ahead and do the Gutenberg thing. <laughs> right? And we're used to it, so we don't really think much of it, most of us. We go, okay, that, that's okay, that's just how it is. But here's the problem. That's not how our friends think. That's not how the people we work with think. That's not how the people we work out at the gym think. That's not how our neighbors think. So in a Google culture, what's, what's the main thing? Well, I want to tell you, I still think this is the main thing. I think this is the main thing. We've got to keep the main thing. Jesus' parting shot. His last words weren't, hey, make sure you preserve the way it's always been done. <laughs> no. Hey, make sure you get a whole bunch of people to your party. No. This is it. Therefore, as you go, as you go, Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I think we need to keep the main thing the main thing. And I think the main thing is that as we go, we're supposed to be touching people and connecting them to God. That's the main thing. Not worship style, not musical style, not volume of music, not decorating. <laughs> right? Those aren't the main things. The main thing is, as we go out, are we going to touch people and connect them to Christ? That's the main thing. The main thing. Now, gang, here, here, here we've got to really be honest with ourselves because we can't get to where we want to go unless we will be honest and agreeing on where we are. Right? Right? I mean, think about Google Maps now. It's a Google age, right? You can go ahead and do a search and say, hey, I'm looking for Bridge Street Mall. And it'll say Bridge Street Mall, boom. And it you know, takes the little pin dot and goes, boom. <laughs> and, then, and then you can hit directions to here. Right? Directions to here. And then you've got to tell it from where. You want directions to here from where? If you don't know where you are, you can't get there. Because map doesn't know how to work. Map doesn't, can't, they can't map it for you. So where, Ron, do you want directions from to get to Bridge Street Mall? And you've got to tell it. It's the same thing in life. If we as a church, and I'm talking the big C church, but it's true of us too here. If we can't agree that the main thing is that as we go, we're supposed to be connecting people to Christ, then it really doesn't matter what models we engage because we can't agree on the main thing yet. And we can't agree that we haven't done a good job of that. I want to read to you another passage that you'll know. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear him, Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus told them this parable, this story. 
Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and searches for the lost sheep until he finds it? Jesus was already on the Google thing, on the search. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one, does not... Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So let's just sound off a minute. What do you notice about these couple passages? What are the things that pop out at you, what we've just been talking about? What hits you? Just popcorn learning. One word, two words. What do you, the focus is on the lost. The focus is on the lost. Good. What else? Thanks, Tammy. What's that? Searching. Searching. Yeah. What else? It brings great joy to God's heart. He rejoices and sings. The angels sing. Okay. Someone's converted. Okay. Good. Have to leave something. To leave. Ah. ah, interesting, Danny. All right, Danny says, yeah, that the, they had to leave something behind. Something went on hold. Huh. Very interesting. Very interesting. What else? Yeah, step out of your cell. You had to get out, move on. Got, thanks, Ken. Got to step out of yourself. Got to move on. Yeah, okay, good. Really good. Other observations? Could be dangerous where you're going. Could be dangerous where you're going. Right? I mean, the disciples said, hey, Jesus, we'll follow you wherever. Remember that? And Jesus said, well, yeah, hold the show a minute. I mean, foxes at least have a place to go sleep. Me? Not always. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. Jesus, we will follow you. This is Matthew 8. And so Jesus... Walked right down into a boat. You remember the story? The disciples followed him in the boat, and the boat promptly was in the teeth of a hurricane. Oh, geez, Jesus. I, did, you, I mean, we will like follow you wherever you want to go as long as it's safe. As long as it's not scary, Carl. What else? Any other observations about these texts? They rejoice with other believers. They rejoice with other believers. Okay, good. Yeah. you got to realize you've lost something. Karen says, you got to realize you lost something. To even go on the hunt. Good. Really good. Anything else? See, I think it's all about the search, gang. You know what's interesting about that passage, those two passages? Jesus says that as you go, I think we need to ask, are we going even? Right? We've got to ask, what is it that we're searching for and who is it that we're searching for? I think what Danny said is really right and I think that's, what, that's what, one of the things that really strikes me about the passage is that the shepherd and the woman, and the shepherd one is really such a powerful image, left 99 sheep. Here's the image, right? They're out sheep herding, doing his thing, and left 99 sitting there on the side of the hill to go hunting for one that was lost. You're thinking, dude, you're in jeopardy of losing the 99. Right? I mean, that's what would strike me. Yes, you got the sheep herder dogs circling them up, you know? But the notion that we've got to be willing to say, hey, are the needs of the 99 able to be put on hold long enough that the search can get conducted? Right? Because at the end of the day, the actual only reason, and this is why I've got this first question, what are you searching for? I think the way we answer this first question, what are you searching for, is in part answered by how you answer the last two. You know what I'm searching to do? I think it's probably the same thing you are. I want to see people I love connected to God. 
Anybody else have that passion at any level? That's the main thing. That's the main event. And that last question, what are they searching for? What are you searching for? Who are you searching for? And what are they searching for? What are the people in your webs of friendships, your family circle, the people that you work with, the neighbors that are around you, the people you're at the gym with, the people at the restaurants you frequent, what are they searching for? What are they looking for? Because you know what? The first thing out of our mouths is usually not the first thing out of their mouth. We say goofy things like, well, you know, they're trying to figure out what to believe about God. Baloney. Most of them don't have any clue that that's the driving need in their life. I need to find out what God's about. If that was the case, they'd be in the church trying to figure it out. Right? That's not what most of my friends are looking for, is it yours? They want happiness. They want peace. They want contentment. They want to figure out how their life can work better. Am I right or wrong? Is, are these your neighbors or not? Just mine. Right? Uh, you know, they're not trying to figure out what to believe about doctrines. What are we thinking, man? We've got to get back into the Google world. We're all Gutenberg, man. We live in a Google world, and you know what? Here's the challenge with the Gutenberg world. The Gutenberg world and Andrew Carnegie were all about providing answers. Books provide answers. Right? Books are important. I, I'm, and listen, I'm all about books. I read two to three hundred a year. I read four or five hundred book reviews a year. It's part of my job, part of my life. I'm a voracious learner. But you know what? Most of the people I know they're actually not really too content with the pat answers that I've got. Do you know what? In the Google world, it's all about the questions. Isn't it? Google as a search engine is all about questions. And you know what I think is going to happen if we're not careful? The church is going to continue to provide tons and tons of answers for questions no one's asking. Hmm? I think we're answering all sorts of questions that nobody gives a darn about. <laughs> That's why I asked the questions before. What are you searching for? Who are you searching for? And what are they searching for? What are they typing into the Google search engine line of their lives right now? What is it? Because you know what? If you and I don't know the answer to that question, there's no way to at least meet them there and help them take a journey. And I think that's our main thing, isn't it? As you go, make disciples. That's the event. That's the main thing. If we don't even know what the questions are they're asking, we can't even meet them there and say, hey, let's have a conversation about that. Because you know what people in the Google culture have found out? They have found out, most of them, that the church has a prescribed set of answers that were immovable and unyielding about. And so once we've spit out our answer, they're like, okay, thank you for your answer, next. Because they're on a journey. They have some questions. They want to process that. They want some conversation. But we, we Gutenberg them. We say, no, 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 listen. We have the answer. <laughs> Don't we? Talk to your friends. That's their, those people outside of the church gang, if we're not honest about this, we're going to miss the whole main thing here. If we're not honest about it, we will not be able to hear them. They think that we're crack-ups because we're so certain about our answers and we won't even enter a conversation. And they just want a conversation. They 
under, they want to understand. They want to enter into dialogue. They want to have a safe forum. They want a place where they're going to get the gospel crammed down their throat. Do we want to get them connected to God? You bet we do. But there's a process for that. It's different for everybody. It's circuitous for some. It's direct for others. Right? I mean, but in the Google world, man, I mean, that's, that's why we're going we're gonna to spend the next eight weeks processing what does it mean for you and I to do life as Christ followers in a Google world? Because I don't think the church has taught us how to do that. The church is teaching us how to do life in ministry in a world that's already died. You know, one of the reasons I have a job, I mean, most of you don't know the whole story of what I do. I, I mean, I, I haven't been in a local church as a pastor in 10 years. I'm a church helper. I do church consulting and coaching, right? But do you know the main reason I have a job? Because the, the church is stuck in Gutenberg. Seriously. <laughs> the main reason I have a job is church is going, you know, Ron, we're not really, really sure how to figure out how to reach the people around us. Do you know why? Because they are convinced that if they build it, they will come. That's nice in the field of dreams, but it doesn't work in the church. <laughs> right? Because what did Jesus say? What did the passage say this morning? As you go, make disciples. Not try to magnetize them to this. Right? As you go. As the 99 stand on the side of the hill, go on the search. As you notice you're supposed to have 10 coins and you only have 9, get on your hands and knees and start looking. That's the image here. It's an image of intensity and focus and we've got to get this done and we've got somebody lost and this is critical. And I mean, come on, parents, have you ever had one of your kids wander off in a store, right? We've all had the experience, I think. Most of us at some point in time go, oh my gosh, right? I mean, and you get this sinking feeling like, oh my gosh. I mean, enough parents are laughing, you've had the experience, obviously. <laughs> and we're not talking about losing meant target here, we're talking about eternity. <laughs> Do we have a sinking feeling, a panicky feeling about that? Because, I mean, it's, it's panicky enough to lose your kid in Target. And they're spinning around underneath, the, you know, great big hanging, you know, skirts. <laughs> trying to paw their way out. That was my experience. My little daughter, where's Ari? You know, I mean, you guys, some of you met her last week. You know, she's 19 and as tall as I am now, but where's Ari? I don't know. Where's Ari? I don't know. Kinda, then, then you drop to your knees and you're looking for little feet. <laughs> yeah, she's in the skirt carousel, like, pawing her way out. Like, A Gutenberg world wants to tell people the text, the Google culture would have us go on a search. A Gutenberg world wants to give answers, a Google world asks questions. A Gutenberg folk, a Gutenberg person, are pretty certain and smug. Google folks are open and curious. That's the picture of our culture. Not just true in the church, I think it's a cultural picture. So here's the question for us today about keeping the main thing the main thing. What are you searching for? Who are you searching for? And what is it that we think they are searching for? Another way of saying it is, who specifically are you building bridges with? Who specifically do you get up in the morning and say, you know what, I, I am going to continue to pray for them and I'm going to continue to pray for their openness. I'm going to continue to pray that I can be in a relationship with them where they can tire kick my life. I'm going to be there for them in times of pain. Jesus said they are going to know that we are Christians by our answers. I mean, our love. 
Not our answers. They will know who we are and who we serve, not by the answers we give, but by the love that we show. They will know we are Christians by the detailed evidence and arguments we give for the existence of God. No? No. That's Gutenberg. That's Gutenberg. That's the modern medical model. It's all about evidence. Nobody cares about evidence. Do you know what the, Gutenberg, the Google world says about evidence? It says, that's good evidence for you, but that doesn't work for me. Well, hang on, it's evidence. That's fine. Am I right? That's where my friends are. That's where the people I know are. That's where the educated guys and gals I hang out with are. They have no wick for our pat answers. None. Because they want a conversation. That requires of you and I a tremendous responsibility and a pretty incredible fluidity with the sort of questions that they want to ask. And we're like, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know anything about that, but you know what the Bible says. And they're like, I don't care. Right? That's our culture, gang. That's the ministry area that you and I have been invited into. I want you to think about this. Jesus was so into hanging out with people far from God at parties and places of questionable reputation that he was called a glutton and a drunkard. Another one of the things the church has absolutely, in my mind, upside down. Jesus intentionally hung out, spent time with people and places that created accusation because he wanted the religious establishment to recognize that they had it all wrong. And you know what the church is more often like? The Pharisees than Jesus. True or false? We're saved anyway. Right? We're saved anyway. Perceived. Oh, perceived. Anyway. Perceived, yep. The motivation for God wasn't only the search, it was the great love. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. I think the mindset in our midst and in the church, I mean, again, I'm talking about the big C church this morning. Where it fits for us, we have to own it, I think. I think the mindset has to change that our fundamental call is just to be faithful. I hear this all the time. I hear it in conferences. I hear it in coaching sessions. I hear it in churches all the time. Yeah, but you know what? We haven't grown in years and years and years, but our call is to be faithful. And I say baloney. Baloney. Jesus didn't say, hey, just faithfully preach the, the message on the side of a hill and hope. He said, make disciples. That's an outcome-based statement. Make disciples. Either you are making disciples or you are not. You can't just, well, I faithfully tried. No, you either do or you don't. This notion that, well, we just, you know, we faithfully do it and we leave the rest to God. Well, yeah, God does that. That's absolutely right. But Jesus did not say, hey, just faithfully proclaim the gospel. I hear this about ineffectiveness all the time. We just faithfully proclaim. Nothing's happened in 10 years. We've never, we haven't baptized an adult believer ever, but you know what? We're faithful. You're not faithful. Those churches are not faithful. Pure and simple. And until we can own the reality of where we sit, we'll never get where we need to go. Does that make sense? We've got to get somewhere, gang. And I think what the thing that God really challenges us with is we are all, every one of us as individuals, we're surrounded by people that don't know God. And a lot of us, I think, sometimes have the idea, well, the church will reach them. <laughs> but that's us. <laughs> right? I mean, the church, that's you and me and him and her and us. Right? So I think this is what we want to think about. How many of you have family and friends, neighbors and colleagues that deep down you really desire to see connected to God? Because I've got some.
And I want to figure out over the next number of weeks, how can we do that more effectively? How can we figure out a way to reach the people around us? Because it's the main thing. Because heaven will rejoice at just one. It will require on our parts a willingness to lay aside our preferences. It will require of us laying aside our own pet horses, hobby horses. But you know what? I want to tell you something. And many of you have been at baptism services. But the first time that one of your family, close family members, the first time one of your very close friends that you've prayed for for a couple years, you've been present to in their lives. Is it a lake or a river around here? And you're invited down into the water to baptize them because you've been their main connection. That will change your life. Amen. If we never see an already churched person walk through the doors of this place, I could really care less. Because what I'm most interested in are the people you know that are far from God, seeing them get connected to God. Because that's the main thing. Amen. Father, this morning we come with all of our Gutenberg attachments and all of our desires to do Google ministry. With all of our drive to be faithful, we feel a prick in our conscience to be fruitful. And so, Father, this morning would you Stir in us this drive. Stir in us this passion, this sense of call. Stir in us love for you and love for those far from you. And over the next weeks, let us wrestle with what is it that we're actually searching for and who are we searching for and help us get in touch with what they are searching for. In Jesus' name. Amen.